So this is going to be in English because our next speakers are Ron Anavi and Gal Cohen from Cisco, and they are going to to speak in English. Ron is an experienced developer with a long history in different technologies, platforms, positions, and companies. Gal is a software engineer and owns a blog about uh, Dockerization solutions for Python, and uh, they are going to talk about boosting development in a uh, container as a microservices environment. Hello, everyone, uh, and good morning. Um, you already did the introduction, so uh, yes, we'll skip it for today. So let's start with the with our agenda. Um, we were, we've been working for the last year uh, on a project called uh, Shadow IT. Um, we'll go through the project. Uh, we'll go through our story with Docker. We'll talk about a little bit about our CI system uh, that we implemented. We're going to talk about uh, image optimization using uh, Docker containers. Um, we're going to talk about our end-to-end -end service. Um, a little bit about our uh, local dev environment. Um, Let's get starting. So the Shadow IT pro uh, project. Um, so the idea behind this project, in a nutshell, is uh, monitoring uh, organizational network traffic, meaning taking uh, Cisco as an organization have many, many tenants using its system uh, um, hardware. So at a certain point, Cisco decided to um, start a project analyzing the uh, network traffic that runs on our hardware. So in general, that's what we're doing. Um, we're talking about currently about uh, 1.2 billion uh, events per day. Um, currently, we're running for 147 uh, organizations, and it's going to scale up to 2,000 organizations in the near future. Um, we're running on Amazon uh, infrastructure. Our main uh, stack is running on S3. EMR, RDS, and ECS. Um, our Python stack, our application stack, is running Flask, uh, Celery, running uh, Redis as our uh, broker and uh, cache. Um, so let's start with uh, our story with Docker. Um, I think that the organizational circumstances always are a huge part of the project, so that's what we're going to start with. Um, we were two team members, me and my team lead. Um, so we started hearing about uh, containers. We didn't really know anything about it. We started messing with it. Um, so we started with local builds, initiating it locally, and pushing it manually to ECR, our uh, containers registry in, uh, in Amazon. Um, at that time, we were mostly focused on bringing value. We weren't uh, focused at all uh, implementing a new CI system or using a CI system. Um, so at a specific point, Cisco decided to allocate more resources to the project. So we grew from two developers, backend developers, working on the project to 20 developers, and developers from the United States, from India. And we need to grow. We need to scale and reduce our build time. We need to scale because we had more developers joining the project. I guess I, I'm trying to make you guys relate to the project and the problems that we had by showing the problems that we had. So I'm guessing that each and every startup or each and every employee or team lead here uh, wants to have the confidence deploying new code to production. Um, so. One of our main concerns uh, implementing the CI is making sure that we trust our code before we deploy it. And the second thing is making the developers feel responsible for what they're doing. Meaning, you're a developer, you're deploying to prod, and you own whatever you deploy to, pro to prod at a specific point. Um, and we'll talk how we, about how we, or how we tried <laughs> to reach this point. So we'll start off our. Uh, we we'll start with. Uh, we'll continue with our CI system. Um, we're using Drone IO. Um, in general, you can see the schematics. We're starting with um, the developer um, with a trigger event of a push to GitHub, uh, which triggers a webhook to Drone IO to, to our CI system. Drone IO initiates the build. 
start uh, the unit test, integration tests. Talk, uh, one we'll talk about it um, later, how we use the end-to-end -end service that we implemented as well. And from our registry, the ECR, um, the images are pulled for, uh, 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 by ECS. Um, so the idea is uh, reaching a point where we can deploy multiple times per day uh, to production, having confidence in what we, we're deploying. Um, okay, so the why. Um, parallel builds, meaning each and every developer in the team doesn't need to wait for um, the system to be available, um, meaning our the first developer or the second developer won't wait until the first build will end. One of our concerns were how our developer that have no experience in Docker um, will deploy this code um, as fast as possible uh, iteratively. So using RCI, um, actually the developer didn't know, they didn't need to know any, anything about Docker. So in general, let's talk about, let's talk about how Drone CI and Jenkins and Travis works in the context of, doc, in, in the context of Docker. Um, we're running on EC2, but it's, uh, it's, it's valid for any cloud provider. Um, for each and every step in the build pipeline, the CI runs a new container. The container runs whatever commands uh, um, uh, you like to run in the pipeline. Um, so this raises some problems. For instance, um, cache invalidation between two containers in the build step. Um, in the, between build steps. Um, cache invalidation between two different builds, meaning if I have one build, I have few layers that can be uh, invalidated or not shared with the instance itself um, between the container running the build step and the bare machine. So um, we talk about um, a small build, a short build pipe, pipeline. Um, this is um, a YAML file used by uh, um, drone CI. Um, as you can see, in line nine, we have shared volume between the instance itself and the container that is running the step build, meaning the next container and the next build will know the cache, uh, will know the layers that were cached in the previous builds. Um, <coughs> as you can see here in uh, line 18, for instance, um, the image, image has been pushed to the registry only on event of GitHub push. So the developer can initiate a new build without even knowing about it uh, with this branch to, develop, to dev environment. And at the point when he wants to uh, deploy it to stage and prod, he can do it as well without any knowledge in Docker. So let's talk about Docker image optimization and why, why should we even handle with it. Um, so first of all, we want to deal with Docker Im image optimization to make our build time shorter. Um, we want to have short upload and download uh, from our registry time. Um, and obviously, uh, nice to know, um, your image will be less vulnerable. What, what do I mean by saying your image will be less vulnerable? If you use Linux iPine as your base image, and you'll choose and you'll install on it only whatever you need, it will be less vulnerable because you have less modules and packages installed on it. Um, okay, so regarding run commands, I think that most of the people here that knows Docker um, understands what I'm talking about. Um, each and every layer or each and every line of uh, uh, code in a Docker file is a layer. Uh, when you unify run commands, um, your the odds that the cache will be invalidated um, and the reinstallation of a specific layer or a specific dependency are getting smaller. If you have less sun commands, meaning you have less layers, meaning you have a um, um, linear image and uh, the, the, the entire build cycle, it doesn't really mean that you have linear, linear image. It, will, it, meaning, it means that you have shorter build time because the layer itself won't be, the, the odds that it will be invalidated, invalidated 
getting uh, smaller. Um, and remove compile time dependencies. We're going to talk about a multi-stage build uh, just in a sec. And if one of you guys, of, or some of you guys know the AWS uh, container registry UI, this is an example for uh, how we started with 350 something megabytes image in, in one day work. Um, we managed to get to 65 megabytes. Um, I think this, like, this is kind of the kind of things that um, if you put really small effort can make a huge difference for the entire company that you're working for. And that's how it was with us. Um, OK, so as I, talked, as I said earlier, um, as, as I started talking about, um, caching um, the installations, the, the library installations will be at top of the Docker file uh, to avoid cache invalidation. Um, remember that the cache, cache in Docker file works uh, top down, meaning the first layer, which is uh, invalidated, will invalidate the entire uh, um, layers in the Docker file. So let's go through uh, quickly on the uh, um, multi-stage build with, uh, with uh, Python. Um, we're starting in line one um, with the statement as, um, if you know it, um, aliasing using uh, um, our base image. At the seventh line, we're, we're install, actually installing our compile time dependencies, our uh, GCC compiler, uh, which is not needed on, um, on our target image, on our production ready image. On the installation uh, line, which the, the run uh, the thirteenth line, um, we're actually installing the project dependencies. I hope that you see it. I can't see it. Um, we're installing the project dependencies and creating weird files. Those weird files will be installed on the target container um, without all the compiler dependencies. Um, as you can see in the curly brackets, you can see the two stages: the first stage and the second stage. Um, at the second stage, um, we, we, we're reusing um, the Python Alpine line 15. Um, it's the original image without all the, without all the installed packages and compilers that we um, uh, installed. And actually, in line 16, we're copying from base, from the base image that we aliased as base, to the target image. We're installing the entire uh, project with the wheel files. Um, so in Line 18, as you can see, we're installing the dependencies on the target image um, using the wheel files that we created in the base image without having the compile time dependencies, meaning that at the target image we have all our dependencies installed without the um, compile time de uh, dependencies. So the result of our uh, image optimization and our CI system that we took care of shared the cache between builds, between the containers and the instance itself resulted in a reduction of image, image size as, as, as I showed you from um, within 50 megabytes to 65 and reduced our build time from six minutes to uh, one minute overall. And then now on my colleague. <coughs> Thank you, so I uh, don't have much time so I'm gonna run. Excuse me for that. Uh, so let's talk about uh, another step in our uh, a continuous deployment pipeline. In moving towards a continuous uh, deployment, we had to create a trust-worthy uh, barrier, uh, and then we decided to uh, actually develop the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, services. So when we deploy a new feature or modify the uh, new feature, we want to make sure uh, that we uh, don't break uh, our service contracts. We want to catch uh, potential bugs. Uh, before uh, our client uh, do, and we want, uh, in general, to improve our uh, prod uh, uh, environment stability and uh, reliability. So this is um, uh, charts. Uh, we choose to implement uh, this service as uh, containerized uh, microservices, like uh, other microservices uh, in the system. Uh, we expose an API, which uh, 
uh, actually uh, execute a predefined set of, uh, of scenarios. Scenarios is uh, flow in our system uh, as part of our uh, CI CD uh, deployment. Uh, a typical uh, scenario is constructed of uh, um, different steps where um, basically each step uh, uh, is uh, mimic uh, service uh, functionality. Uh, so cu currently our, our deployment to uh, um, production involves uh, uh, two environments, staging and, and, and production. Uh, our E2E uh, service uh, runs uh, on, uh, on each of them. On staging, it runs as acceptance test. On production, it runs as a smoking test. And of course, it will propagate to the next environment uh, only if uh, all the scenarios passed uh, in, the, in the first environment. Uh, we cover a, a wide range of, uh, of scenarios from uh, log ingestion uh, to provision uh, uh, new tenants in our system and uh, testing uh, API endpoint uh, consumptions. There are days uh, which we deploy uh, multiple uh, times, and this service actually gives us the confidence to uh, keep doing so. Uh, once the developers uh, feel comfortable uh, with this work and he wants to deploy it, he just uh, push uh, the tag, and our Intuit service uh, uh, will run as part of our um, uh, CI/CD pipeline. So, local dev env. Uh, this is our last item in the agenda for today. Uh, you probably ask yourself. Okay, this is quite uh, obvious. Uh, we all develop on a local, uh, our local environment. In a, a, a multi-microservices environment, things uh, start to get, uh, or tend to get uh, complicated. And we're gonna show it. So uh, why do we need a, a local dev environment with all our microservices uh, running? Uh, so, um, again, we have more than 20 uh, microservices. Uh, I'm going to uh, refer to microservices as a service for because, uh, again, I don't have much time. Uh, so we have more than 20 services uh, in, uh, in our system, which were uh, developed uh, by different teams, are maintained by uh, different teams. Um, and uh, each service has its uh, uh, dependencies and not all our developers are familiar with all the dependencies uh, in, and that each service uh, is uh, required. So this is one reason why to, uh, to have some local stable environment. Uh, also, each team has uh, its own dev, uh, remote dev cluster. And we notice that um, uh, our developer uh, on complex uh, tasks. So uh, instead of uh, testing and debugging uh, everything locally, they prefer to uh, deploy the work uh, to, to the remote uh, machine and test and debug uh, over there. So uh, we want to speed up uh, our development, uh, which means less deployment. Less deployment means, means that you, uh, have, you don't have to coordinate with your team member. Uh, wait, I want to deploy something. I want to test it. Wait that I finish. And is it wait? And uh, you uh, save, uh, you, you spend a lot of time. Uh, so um, you have less bottlenecks. Uh, and I, I think we should aspire, you know, to to deploy our code to a remote uh, environment only after we, we test it and, and, and everything works as expected. Uh, Another reason was that uh, a, new, a new developer, you know, we, want, we really want to uh, ease the onboarding uh, phase of a new developer to, uh, to our system. So you don't, a new developer doesn't have to read a lot of documents and follow a complicated instruction uh, to um, uh, actually uh, use the local uh, environment. So this is, uh, was not our first attempt in uh, developing a local dev environment. Uh, uh, we had the we had, uh, on each service, uh, we actually had a Docker file and Docker Compose file. And on top of it, we have uh, a, a, a script which actually orchestrated them all. But this solution wasn't good enough. Uh, the script was very complicated. It wasn't very uh, scalable. Uh, it was maintained by only one dedicated team. And sometimes services were uh, overridden by others. Uh, so, um, our next, our next approach was, uh, okay, let's leave the, in, the implementation of uh, internal Docker Compose file uh, for times that we want to uh, run our services standalone. And we decided to create a new repo uh, with a unified Docker Compose file. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's required uh, a script. So now, uh, with only one command, a Docker Compose app, uh, we can deploy all our services uh, in our local, uh, local machine. 
in this uh, approach, uh, we tackle several issues, which uh, we'll see in, uh, in a minute. So first issue uh, was the init problem. We have services which uh, requires uh, initialization uh, process. Now, uh, we can uh, tackle this in two options. Uh, one, we can uh, actually wait for the service to uh, to to actually run and then run the manual script, but this means that we move the responsibility to the developers. He has to wait for the service to, to run and then decide when is the right time to uh, run the script. Another uh, approach was actually uh, to run all this init logic in a dedicated uh, container. Uh, now, uh, in the slide, you can see that I mentioned uh, the depends on. Uh, I don't know how, how much of you uh, know familiar with that. So Docker has different uh, states. One of them uh, is running, but running doesn't mean that the service that which is hosted uh, in the container is ready to uh, accept um, a request from uh, outside. So uh, the, in the sample that you see, Okay, so we have like uh, two types of uh, containers. We have one which uh, actually hosts the service and another, uh, and listen to re incoming requests, and another which uh, we use to run a dedicated task uh, and immediately uh, exit. Uh, we use it the wait for it. You can see we have the uh, etcd and then we have the etcd in it. And basically behind the scene, we just ping the, uh, the service and when we get a reply, we can uh, execute uh, the command. Uh, another uh, option that we, uh, so another issue that we encounter was that uh, the usage of uh, multiple uh, database. So uh, different uh, uh, services uh, depends uh, on, uh, on, Postgres, on Postgres container uh, with the relevant uh, uh, database. And on our unified compose, we could have chose the, could, could have chosen that uh, we can uh, okay we can just uh, duplicate it and have uh, uh, several uh, Postgres containers. Oh, I don't have much time. Uh, but uh, we decided to take another approach and actually to unify uh, all this, um, all this uh, database under uh, uh, one uh, DB container. Um, I can talk. We use a script which actually uh, load all this database. Unfortunately, I don't have my time, much time I have to run. Uh, we also encounter like service inflation. Uh, some of our services are built from APIs and uh, offline processing. And again, we didn't want to have uh, too much services, so we decided to actually unify them uh, into uh, one uh, container. Uh, I think a, be a best practice, once you're uh, working locally, uh, you want to stay local. You don't want to uh, get outside to external services. So, uh, and as you as Carl mentioned, we use a lot of AWS services, so we, we just fake them. So we, we use a, a different, a, a, here we use for, for S3, a, we experiment different solution, and uh, eventually, um, that's it, eventually uh, we choose the fake S3, which is a solution for Python. Um, so we, I, I hope uh, if we need to wrap up, so again, there are many different ways to, to tackle uh, what we dis what we discuss here. Um, I hope this lecture gave you some ideas. Uh, we are still, our project is still evolving, and that's it. <laughs>